So now let's move to chicken pox briefly. So I'm by no means an expert in this, but I will tell you what I know. So um, these are clearly pictures of children that Google has brought up here. So if we have a look at uh, this one here, so this is uh, this young boy has got chicken pox. And you can see that the lesions that it is forming are similar to what we've seen previously for hepatic skin infections. So you've got vesicles again that are sort of gold in colour and with a surrounding area of red indurated skin. But here, unlike in the pictures of previous hepatic infections that we've seen, it's not focal, it's generalised. So these lesions are all over the body in chicken pox. So let's just talk briefly about how this is transmitted. So actually, VZV can cause an upper respiratory tract infection, so it can infect the nasal mucosa and the pharyngeal mucosa and indeed the tracheal mucosa. So it can cause like a cold or a fluey, a coughy, sneezy, runny nose sort of infection. And then from there, it can go into the blood to the skin all over the body and cause these lesions, which is where it's infected the skin. So this means that there are actually two different ways that chicken pox can be transmitted. Either it can be transmitted in the respiratory fashion, so the child sneezes or coughs and brings up loads of the virus in their sneezes and coughs, which then another child breathes in or another person breathes in, and then they get a respiratory infection and then from the respiratory mucosa, it goes into the blood and then to their skin. Or alternatively, the places on the skin where these lesions are forming, the virus will then be present there and from contact that can then spread to someone else's skin and then a child can start off primarily with a skin infection that way. So they can just get the skin infection from chickenpox rather than having the respiratory infection. Or alternatively, they might get contact from the skin. So let's say two children, one has chicken box, the other one touches this child's skin, touches these lesions, and then touches their nose with their fingers. Then the virus gets into their nose that way. So these are ways in which chicken box can be transmitted. But be aware that it doesn't just infect the skin, it infects the respiratory mucosa in most children and causes a respiratory infection before it then leads to the skin eruption. But it can transmit from skin to skin. Now, shingles likewise, the place where the rash is, is going to be loaded with virus that can be transmitted. However, if someone has had chicken pox, they will then be immune to VZV. So even if, let's say an adult, a 40 year old adult who had chicken pox when they were a child, when they were five years old, they will still be immune to VZV. Their immune system continues the battle all the time to keep the VZV that is still in their body under suppression. So that means that if they come in contact with a child or if their child has chicken pox, they do not need to worry. They can touch the child's skin, they can breathe in the air that the child is breathing and they will not catch chicken pox again because they're immune to it. Similarly, if someone has shingles, so let's say an adult has shingles and another adult comes along who has already had chicken pox, they can touch that rash without fear. They will not get chick the chicken pox again and they will not get shingles either from that. The only way that you can get shingles is if you have a lull in your immune system's ability to control the VZV that is already in your body. So shingles is not contagious to someone who has already had chicken pox. When shingles is dangerous is if that person with shingles then comes in contact with someone who has not had chicken pox, either a child who has not yet had chicken pox, if they come in contact with an adult with shingles and there's contact transmission, then that child will get chicken pox. Alternatively, if you have an adult who somehow hasn't had chicken pox, then if they come in contact with someone who either has shingles or chicken pox, they risk getting chicken pox. So be aware that Shingles is transmissible, but only at, to someone who hasn't had chicken pox, and they won't get shingles, they will get chicken pox. So you cannot transmit shingles. You can transmit varicella zoster to someone who hasn't, isn't immune, who can then get chicken pox, but you can't transmit it to someone who's already had chicken pox and give them shingles, and you can't give someone who hasn't ever had chicken pox the shingles infection. They'll get a chicken pox appearance. They won't get a dermatomal rash in the way uh, that shingles is.
So enough of talking about the conditions then. Let's now talk about the actual treatment, uh, the treatment regimes. So acyclovir is available as creams and eye drops and tablets and as an intravenous preparation. So let's firstly just talk about a cyclovir cream. So you can get creams that are suitable for putting on the inside of the mouth or and on the lips to treat um, hepatic infections there, herpes simplex infections there. Uh, you can also get creams that are suitable for putting on the skin to treat hepatic skin infections, HSV1 and HSV2 skin infections, and creams that are suitable for putting on the genitals to treat hepatic skin infections there. Eye drops are also available that can be put in the eyes for people with hepatic keratitis. And now let's talk about the tablets. So tablet-wise, acyclovir mainly comes in 200 milligram tablets. And regimes often if we're treating, let's say, a bad hepatic skin infection or a hepatic mucosal infection or genital herpes infection, the regime we often use is 200 milligrams five times a day. So one 200 milligram tablet and you take one five times a day. So you might take one at 9 a.m., one at midday, one at 3 p.m., one at 6 p.m., one at 10 p.m. That would make up a nice uh, evenly spaced or reasonably evenly spaced five times a day regimen. Now, if the infection is really severe, and we saw some pictures of really horrible uh, HSV skin infections, or the genital infection is really severe and they're getting really bad pain from the rash, um, then it can be upped to a more intensive regimen of 400 milligrams five times a day. In terms of how long these treatment courses last, it's usually between five to 10 days. And again, you would judge it depending on how severe the infection is. If you're just trying to clear a quite small um, skin infection from herpes, then you might just give 200 milligrams five times a day for five days. Whereas if it's really extensive hepatic skin infection, awful, then you might go more intensively for 400 milligrams five times a day for 10 days. More doses, we talk about the hepatic suppression dose. So this is 400 milligrams, so two of these tablets twice a day. So you might take one in the morning, one at night. This is given for conditions, as we discussed earlier, where once it clears, it then comes back if you stop the therapy. So hepatic keratitis, in these people who can't clear the hepatic infection from their cornea, then we put them on indefinite acyclovir, and we call that hepatic suppression dose acyclovir, and that dose is usually 400 milligrams twice daily. If sometimes people get recurrent infections of the skin from HSV1 and HSV2, so maybe recurrent genital outbreaks. So they get one, you treat them, it goes away, but then the, when the treatment is stopped, it comes back, you treat it again, and then when the treatment stops, it comes back. If they do have recurrent infections like that that just come back over and over again, then those people again can be put on long-term hepatic suppression therapy, and again, that would be this sort of dose. And then I've put this dose down here, which is 800 milligrams five times a day. This is the dose that is used to treat varicella zoster infections. So shingles is treated with this high dose, 800 milligrams five times a day, usually again for five to 10 days. Chicken pox can also be treated with this. Again, as I explained earlier, the purpose of treating shingles isn't really to make it go away quicker. It has very small, if any, effect on how long the rash actually takes to get better. It's to prevent the post-hepatic neuralgia. Uh, so that would be the dose that we would treat shingles with to try and prevent the person getting post-hepatic neuralgia. In chickenpox, I'm not, as I say, I'm not massively experienced with chickenpox, but my general understanding is that it often isn't treated with this drug. Instead, you let it self-resolve. Really severe cases that aren't, are taking or are taking a very long time to self-resolve, then maybe uh, GPs and pediatricians might consider using this drug. Um, but generally, most children get chicken box and it self-resolves and they do not get treated for it. Whereas that's not the case with shingles. If you present to a doctor with shingles, you will get treatment. And the purpose of that treatment is to prevent post-herpetic neuralgia. 
Finally, there is intravenous acyclovir that can be administered in hospital. The main situation where we use this is for viral encephalitis, and often, as I say, the cases where I've seen this given is where we're empirically treating for viral encephalitis, and then it's stopped once people realise that this person doesn't have viral encephalitis. Actually, this is the diagnosis that's making them confused or making them uh, in the, be in a comatose state. Other situations where intravenous acyclovir might be warranted, I suppose if someone had a really extensive, horrific, hepatic skin infection that was making them really, really unwell, they might end up being admitted to hospital due to that, and that would be a situation where they would be treated with intravenous acyclovir. So I'm about to finish then. Before we do, I'll just say something about side effects of this drug. Now, it's actually an extremely well-tolerated drug. It has very few side effects. Most people who take it seem to get absolutely no side effects from taking it, which is unusual. Most medications do have side effects, even if it's just epigastric pain. Uh, but acyclovir is very, very well tolerated by most people. Usually it's like they're taking a sugar tablet. They don't feel any side effects from it. If people do get side effects, the one that is most common is nausea. And this actually goes for most antiviral drugs. I would say it's their main side effect, but HIV antivirals are uh, some of the most famous antiviral drugs. Uh, and their classic side effect is nausea, and they can trigger really, really terrible nausea. Acyclovir also can trigger nausea, but to a much lesser extent than the HIV antivirals. Usually, if people do get nauseous with acyclovir, it's only for the first few doses, and then after a few doses, they usually stop getting any nausea, so their body just gets used to it and stops feeling the nausea. So usually it's only a mild nausea that is often only experienced in larger doses, and it gets better after a few doses and they stop getting the nausea. So it's a very well tolerated drug that doesn't usually have side effects. So to summarise then, acyclovir is an extremely well tolerated antiviral drug used to treat infections from HSV1, HSV2 and VZV. Now infections with these three viruses often self-resolve if you give them time anyway. However, treatment with the drug can make them resolve quicker and in the case of shingles can prevent this complication of post-herpetic neuralgia or at least reduce the chance that you will get post-herpetic neuralgia. Also, sometimes these viruses can cause really severe infections, such as extensive skin infections can be caused by herpes simplex in some cases, or they can cause brain infections in some cases, herpetic encephalitis, or eye infections, herpetic keratitis. And in those cases, you really do want to do everything you can to try and bring the infection under control, and acyclovir treatment can be very helpful and crucial in those cases.